All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, they were talking all about right triangle twists. And uh, I'm just going to give just a sec to make sure that everything's connected right, and then I'll dive right into it. Um, we're going to be folding together a practice version of this water strider tessellation that I designed. Um, it's interesting in that it uses both closed and open right triangle twists. So the closed right triangle twist is a more basic twist. And then the open tw right triangle is kind of getting into more advanced twists. So come along with me for the ride. First, I'm going to show you a couple examples of some things that you can do once you know right triangle twists starting with these tessellations in the mixed squares and right triangles tiling. Um, so here I've got square twists both on the diagonals and um, in this case they're on the back um, on the horizontals and verticals of the grid. So all of these tessellations in this stack rely on right triangle twists of one form or another. Um, and if you see me distracted is because I'm not sure if the stream is actually going through. So fingers crossed on that. But anyways, there's some more ways of using right triangle twists with squares. Uh, this one I call small squares and right triangles, the tiling that is. Um, and you see with these small squares and right triangles, you get these column structures. So this one is keeping all the columns on the same side and mirroring between them. And this one is switching those columns onto alternating sides. Uh, here we have another mixed squares and right triangles tiling, actually another two. Um, and these two are somewhat closely related. They both have twists alternating on either side. So you can see there are right triangles on the front and the back. Um, but they all have closed right triangles. This one has some open squares and closed squares. This one has all closed squares, although, as you can see, two different types. Continuing, this tessellation is in a different tiling from the ones we've seen already. I call it large squares and right triangles and it has all open right triangle twists. So you can tell that the twist is open because it leaves this open hole on the back. So continuing from there, here I've got a bunch of tessellations in the square tiling. So how would I use a right triangle if it's just in a square tiling? Well, that's by using it in combination with part of another square. See, the thing about right triangle twists is they're exactly the same as half of an open square twist. So in this one, you can really get in and see that. You can see that each of my right triangles on the upper part of these hybrid square twists is exactly the same so this upper triangle is exactly the same as half cut across the diagonal of this open square twist. And likewise, these other parts can be cut across the other diagonal as well. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. The right triangle twist, which is half of an open square twist cut across the diagonal. And there's a whole variety of ways that you can use these hybrid square twists, which the right triangle twist is kind of a prerequisite for, to create new and interesting designs on top of, so above and beyond, the standard ways of arranging square twists. And here you can see I'm getting into some more general squares. That's another advanced twist 
um, I also used those on uh, this Among Giants tessellation. So you might be wondering, like, what's the sequence of things that will lead me to get to folding something like this? And it's not actually that many steps. So we've got our closed and open square twist, which if you've been following along my series so far, and I'll make sure there's a link available with the recording for the whole playlist uh, of basic twists, you've already learned how to use closed and open square twists. Once you know closed and open square twists, you're gonna wanna learn the right triangle twist, the focus for today, so you can use them in these hybrid square twists. So with that said, let's dive in. Let's take a look at these two new twists that we'll be learning today. I've got my eightfold single diagonal, so that's one diagonal in each grid square. Um, if we're pretending this is a square grid, then I can say this is the grid square and it has one diagonal in it. I make that distinction because if we do a double diagonal, then we treat the grid lines differently. And that's because if I make that double diagonal, it'll make four right triangles in a single grid square instead of two. And these right triangles are still isosceles right triangles. So they still have the same proportions between the edges, and we still maintain the same proportions between the um, horizontal and vertical versus the diagonal. And this will become important as you see once we start folding. So to fold a closed right triangle twist, I'm going to need three pleats. Unlike the equilateral triangle, these three pleats are not spaced evenly apart. They are spaced like the edges of a right triangle. So I've got two of these pleats that are perpendicular to each other. I've got a horizontal and a vertical, again, in the context of a single diagonal grid. And then I have the diagonal that goes out from the confluence of these two perpendicular pleats. So if you're thinking about this in terms of a flat foldable vertex, to make something flat foldable, you need to have um, two more of one kind of fold than the other. So in this case, if I wanted to make this flat foldable, I would add a valley out on um, the extension of the diagonal between the horizontal and vertical, and that would give me a flat foldable intersection. But since we're talking tessellations, we want each bit to be locally flat foldable, but we don't want to be folding the paper in half. So what we're gonna do instead is stick our valleys rotationally symmetrically around our mountain folds. And you'll notice that for the diagonal, the space between the mountain and the valley is larger than it is for our other two pleats. Now this is important because it'll allow one edge of the triangle to be longer than the other two edges. So bringing all of those folds together. And so what I do when I bring these folds together, I focus first on that flat foldable vertex in the center. And then I find the point underneath here where all three of my valley folds come together and then I lay my mountains down onto my valleys. Next I'm going to squash this twist and the important thing is that I keep being aware of the rotation direction that I'm going in because 
you'll notice as I'm squashing, they, there are different lengths to the center point on each of these perpendicular pleats. So on one of these, there is one spacing. On the other, there is two spacings. I would consider this a proper rotation of a right triangle twist. Now, I say proper, what would an improper rotation look like? So this is what you should not do. When you're squashing, you should not push back on a pleat. If you push back on the pleat, then you've switched the orientation. Um, you've switched which direction is the long um, distance to the center and which one is shorter. So this is not what I do for my twists. It is a stylistic look and you could choose to do so for your own. So what I want to make sure of is that the valleys, so you can see the valleys down below are touching the corners of my twist. So that's the check. The mountains are all coming in straight and not doubling back on themselves to get to the twist and the valleys point to the corners of the twists. So that's the closed right triangle. Let's take a look at the open right triangle. And as proof of closeness, here we have it closed on the back. Another thing actually, while we're here, is to take a look at how many grid spacings are underneath the pleats. This can be important when you're reading crease patterns to know, okay, on this diagonal direction, there is one spacing inside the hole. And in these other two directions, there's either one or two grid spacings inside the hole. And I need to check and make sure so I can count accurately from the crease pattern to the paper that I'm folding. So with our closed square twist in place, Actually, this may be a good place to see that this actually is half of an open square twist. So you can see I took my right triangle twist and instead of treating the central square as just something to ignore, I surrounded it by mountain folds like we do with the open square and you can see my half line comes at exactly halfway so i'll leave it back as the closed square twist it's always interesting to see these relationships between the twists that you wouldn't necessarily suspect and grab my second sheet of paper for the open right triangle so just like all the other open twists that we've looked at, when we have an open twist, we are outlining some shape in the grid with our mountain folds of the twist. And so for the first level of open right triangle, there are multiple levels. There's multiple levels with any of these twists. I'm going to pick a grid right triangle I've picked one that touches the middle um, just so we can see how that works out. And from here, I need to pick a rotational handedness. So I need to decide, is it going to rotate right-handed or left-handed? In this case, I'm going to show you how to do it left-handed. So if I'm doing it left-handed, then the long direction comes in left-handedly so I can extend one side of each of these lines around my right triangle in the middle and then my valley folds come to the outside 
So they're always on the outside relative to this central shape. And that's important because with the, uh, with the open twists, in general, you can twist in one direction only. You can't go back in the other direction uh, once you've set your mountain folds. So setting up my mountain folds, I'm going to put my mountains in place all the way around. And you can see as I approach this central right triangle that I'm outlining, I'm not really pinching in tight. I'm leaving it flexed open like we would for a open square twist. And so once this is in place, I can go ahead. So notice I've got my horizontal and my vertical firmly in place. I'm pushing down onto the table. And as I pull my diagonal away, that's going to cause the paper to start to flatten out. Then I can encourage that. Again, I'm making sure that all of my mountain folds are continuing straight. They're never doubling back and carrying on into my open right triangle twist. So now I want you to think to yourself, what is going to be on the back? Like we've been exploring, whatever shape you outline is going to be the shape you get on the back. Now it won't be in this particular orientation. It'll actually be aligned with the rest of the grid. But we've got half of a grid square, one of these right triangles, outlined here on the back. So that is the closed and the open right triangle twist. And I hope you um, give it a try. If you don't have your grids right now, don't worry. The recording will be out very soon. And um, if you're watching the replay, just hit pause, make your grid, and go for it. And as I like to say with my students, it's often helpful to watch first, then do. So when I'm trying to learn a new skill, I like to watch someone do it fully and then maybe go back if there's a recording, which here thankfully there is, and watch it again, this time pausing and making sure that I'm doing things right as I'm going through and um, really focusing on how I can match my movements to theirs the second time that I'm seeing them do it instead of the first. So with that said, let's shift our focus to the tessellation of the day. Now you'll notice that this grid is a lot finer than the grid that I brought to teach with. Like if we, if we look at this, um, this grid is twice as fine as this one. You can see the grid lines are lining up with each other. I started with the same size of square. Um, here I have a 24 fold single diagonal 45 degree grid. So that's 24 with respect to if it were a square grid and then single diagonals added. So I've got a diagonal alternating directions through each square in the main grid. So we're going to be doing a practice tessellation today. Um, this is not going to be a display piece. Now I want that to sink in. So this tessellation is where if you rip it, if you really crumple the collapses, if you, um, just completely, um, have pleat overlaps everywhere and can't resolve it, no one's going to know. This is your first attempt. No one has to see your first attempt, but you. And so let's dive in with that in mind. The first thing I'm going to do is identify the center of 
my grid. Now I'm eyeballing it because I'm used to doing this. If I had a bigger grid, if I was doing this for higher stakes, I would fold my grid in half in one direction, so exactly in half, and then in half in the other direction as well. In this case, we do have grid lines already present on each of these folds, and that's going to point out my exact center of the tessellation. A key thing to keep in mind with these single diagonal grids is that some of the grid intersections will have diagonals and some of them will not. It's 50-50. The center of a single diagonal grid will have diagonals. And so if you're close, you can narrow down the possibilities by saying, does this intersection have diagonals or not? And so what I'm going to do here is put in, since this is a practice piece, I'm going to put in the easiest thing to put in the center, which is a closed right triangle twist. So I'm going to emphasize a horizontal and a vertical and a diagonal. And for this twist, I'm going to choose to make it right-handed. So that means when I bring up my three-way intersection, my three mountain folds, and I find where these three flaps come together underneath, I'm going to rotate it right-handedly so I can trace around with the fingers of my right hand, with my thumb up in the air, trace around the fingers of my right hand and keep everything closed. So if I tried my left hand, I would be pushing things open, but this is right-handed because I can go around it with my right hand. Next up, I'm gonna go ahead and squash and notice I've got my fingers in slightly different locations for these different um, pleats. So as I'm squashing the twist, I'm feeling it out, noticing which of these two directions is the shorter direction and which one is the longer direction. Hint, the one with the longer direction will always be the one that the, the diagonal pleat is falling down towards. So this diagonal pleat is falling down towards this horizontal pleat, towards this flap of paper that the horizontal pleat is connected to. And so this is gonna be the long edge of the triangle, and this is going to be the long corner of the triangle. So then I can go ahead and squash my right triangle twist. And with that twist in place, I'm going to go ahead and flip over to the back side. So what I'm doing here is I'm keeping an eye for rotational alignment on where the diagonal is. This time I'm going to flip so the diagonal is on my upper right. So next up, I want to put in an open right triangle on the diagonal pleat that has its corner coming to the right triangle hole from the other side. Because this is what I see in my example tessellation. I've got a right triangle hole and my new right triangle twist comes exactly to that hole. So, how am I going to do that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, if the corner is coming to that hole, then a valley fold must be coming to that hole. Okay, if a valley fold is coming to that hole, can it be in a 
vertical direction. So my two options here are vertical or horizontal for the direction of the valley coming to that hole. Because the diagonal is already taken. I already have a diagonal, I can't put another diagonal. And so my options are vertical or horizontal. And so when I'm looking at this, I see that in order to get the diagonal pleat to interact with whatever new pleat I'm putting in, this has to be a horizontal pleat. So I'm going to have a valley coming straight out horizontal from the hole, a mountain one grid spacing above that, because that is the pleat depth that we're using, and I can notice that this mountain for the diagonal is coming along there. And there's this shape nestled right in the corner of where these two mountain folds come together, which is the right triangle that I'm going to outline. And so getting this horizontal pleat in place, I can then grab the vertical grid line that is exactly the same one as the one outlining the edge of this right triangle. And I'm going to zoom in to show you a common mistake. So a common mistake would be to look at this in the folded, like diagonal pleat folded form and say, oh, I know which vertical is going to come to here. It's going to be this one because it looks like it comes to there. But no, if I try that, if I use that vertical, that doesn't come to this position at all. It's actually two whole grid spacings off. So I have to look from the triangle outwards when I'm getting my references. I have to look and say, okay, once I open the diagonal pleat, then what grid line is coming exactly in on that edge? And once I've got these things in place, I'm going to hold my triangle on the other side closed. I'm going to push one of my other pleats and I'm going to feel it out. Which one can I get all the way down without causing other things to come undone? And from there, I'm going to push on the top of my twist, getting all three of my pleats flat on the table, on the desk, as I squash this right triangle twist and then smooth it out with my bone folder. So that is the open right triangle twist in the context of this water strider tessellation. So where are we going from here? Well, this water strider tessellation has an interesting structure. It has a lot of mirror symmetry lines. So I've got both horizontal and vertical mirror symmetry lines in this tessellation. In fact, I have mirror symmetry lines between each set of two twists. If I made a box with my mirror symmetry lines, it would hold precisely my open right triangle and my closed right triangle. So what I have right now is all I need as a reference to fold everything else in the tessellation. And that's one of the reasons why I picked this one to teach. So we have a simple reference that uses both the closed and open right triangle without being super expensive in terms of grid. Um, and that's actually a shout out to Kamikyo Dai. 
uh, Ricardo Hinojosa, um, who likes to uh, say that tessellations are more or less expensive in terms of the grid that they use. So I'm going to draw my mirror symmetry lines as a solid blue line as opposed to the dashed blue line that I used for valley folds. And these mirror symmetry lines will go all the way through my uh, paper. And as I draw them, excuse me, as I draw them, they will cross only pleats that are perpendicular to the mirror symmetry line. So if the pleat is perpendicular, then the same grid line that appears to be going straight through is going straight through. But if it's any other angle, then that appearance is false. So I can go ahead and draw all four of my mirror symmetry lines on here. And I'll draw them um, on both sides so we can see how this works out. I'll start by drawing the fourth line on the other side where we can really see the boundaries. So on here I can see that my boundary is exactly where this pleat comes to. So I've got a pleat right here and right at the edge of it I'm going to have my mirror symmetry line as close in as possible. So flipping back to the open triangle side I can feel out okay where is the extension of this pleat and I can finish drawing the box around my two twists. So we're going to get a good amount of tessellation in here um, by repeating these two twists over and over until we get to the edges of the paper. Now the easiest thing to mirror is actually going to be the closed triangle twist. So I'm going to flip my paper back over and you can orient based on where the closed triangle is relative to the open triangle. And what I'm going to do next is fold the right triangle on the opposite side of my drawn mirror line from my original closed right triangle. So the first thing I know is that I'm going to need a pleat out here so I can match this vertical pleat at the mirror symmetry line. The next thing I'm going to look at is I'm going to say, okay, I've got my horizontal, I've got my vertical. That means I need a diagonal from here. I need to find the diagonal line that points straight out and up from my horizontal and my vertical. So I'm going to go ahead and put all of those pleats in place and squash my right triangle twist. So that setup was I identified the mirror line. I saw that I had a horizontal pleat crossing it. So I know I need the same right triangle twist on the other side of the mirror line. Then I figure out where my vertical for the right triangle twist needs to be based on where the vertical from the right triangle on the left hand side is. And then at the intersection of the horizontal and the vertical, I put out a diagonal. While we're on this side, I'm going to draw another mirror symmetry line through here. And again, you see that my mirror symmetry line crosses pleats that are perpendicular to it. And I'm going to go ahead and put two more 
of these closed right triangle twists on the bottom of this mirror symmetry line while I'm here. So one thing that I notice when I'm going to do that is that this mountain fold of the horizontal pleat is two spacings above my horizontal mirror symmetry line. That means that I'm going to need a mountain fold two spacings below the mirror symmetry line as well. So I open up this tube and I find two spacings below the mirror symmetry line. I can put a mountain fold that goes from grid intersection with diagonals to grid intersection with diagonals running into these vertical pleats. So what do I do when I have a horizontal and a vertical? I'm going to need the diagonal at the same point because these are still closed right triangle twists. Once I've got my two diagonals, I can get my horizontal pleat to lay down facing out away from that central mirror line just like the one above it and then I can go ahead and squash one twist at a time and I'll end up with four closed right triangle twists on this side of the paper and I've got one of them already paired with an open right triangle on the back and these three diagonal pleats are going to need more open right triangles on the back to match this one. So from here, I'm going to flip over to the back side. Again, that flipping motion is across that horizontal mirror symmetry line. And I'm going to look for um, what to do next with each of these three diagonal pleats. So I'm going to choose to start with the one on the lower right. And just like the twist before, I want the corner to come exactly to this closed hole. That means I need a valley fold to come to that hole. And it's going to be a horizontal, both because it was a horizontal before and also because that is the direction that will allow me to set up my target right triangle with the diagonal that's already in place. If I put in a vertical, I would just run straight into the next twist and it would be a mess. So with that horizontal identified, and the target right triangle identified, I can open the diagonal pleat, find that vertical that's going to outline my open right triangle, and go ahead and squash that twist in place. From here, we're going to do the same thing on the other two diagonals where I identify the closed hole, the diagonal pleat. I still need a horizontal pleat coming with the valley coming right to the hole. My mountain can come out to the side and that will help me identify my right triangle. So with that right triangle identified, I'm going to pull down the horizontal, opening up the diagonal outside of my target triangle, and identify that vertical pleat that is coming around and finishing up. So with that in place, I'll go ahead and squash my twist. And then 
as on the right side, so on the left, because we are crossing this mirror symmetry line, I'm going to need another valley, which will set up my mountain, which tells me, along with the diagonal, where my target right triangle is. And so with this setup, I can go ahead and fold my horizontal pleat. It's going to open up the diagonal and I want to open it just until the vertical that outlines my target right triangle. So going ahead and squashing. Now I have not just one, but four copies of the closed and open right triangle that have been mirrored relative to each other. And so I can draw in even more mirror symmetry lines. So in this way, we were able to start practicing this tessellation without looking at a crease pattern, without doing any planning, really. We just picked an arbitrary grid and said, okay, I'm going to do this tessellation on this grid as a practice piece. So I can see the structure, so I can see how these twists go together, so I can use pen on it if I want. So that when I then go and do a display type piece, where I'm planning, where do I want the center? How much repetition do I want in this? How much grid does that require? Do I want a border? Does this pattern allow a border? Hint, this one does. Um, and being able to answer these questions, um, then on the display piece, being confident that we're going to be able to execute the moves because we've already practiced them. So next up, what I'm going to do is take these open right triangles and mirror them out so we can then form the next set of, uh, of twists. So one thing that I know from this right triangle is that the diagonal came down and right. So across the mirror line, that's going to mean going up and right. And if the corner is coming exactly to this uh, corner, then my diagonal pleat going up and right is going to be the pleat that contacts at the corner. So here I'm drawing my diagonal pleat first and then saying, okay, with my vertical, that's gonna mean that this right triangle right here is what fits in between these two mountains. And so I can take that setup and go ahead and flatten out my twist. And you can see that all of my paper right here is still contained within the mirror symmetry box. So what this is telling me is I'm not going to have a pleat overlap if I do the open right triangle here on the right hand side as well. So this one will be mirror symmetric I'm going to have my diagonal going up and left this time, which means that my valley for the diagonal comes to the corner, to the point, the location of the mirror symmetry. And I look for my right triangle that is surrounded on all three sides by mountain folds. And I can bring up 
that right triangle. And being careful, especially right here at the edge to keep that pleat flat. I'm going to go ahead and squash my twist. And you can see if I had any more grid up here, I would have an overlap on my hands. And that overlap would resolve into two right triangle twists on the opposite side. Now I'm going to go ahead and see if we can put them in anyways, even though we don't have the overlap. What would it look like if we put these in? So one thing that we can't see right here is the mirror symmetry line that's going through horizontally. So with that mirror symmetry line in place, I can look above and say, okay, two spacings up, AKA where these right triangle holes have their corners. I've got a valley fold all the way across. And what do I have? above, or in this case, below that valley fold, well, I have got a mountain fold. And so then I've got a diagonal, I've got a horizontal. So I'm going to need verticals coming out of these intersections to make new right triangle twists. And so I'm going to set that up and I'm setting the verticals first before folding that horizontal valley. So everything will lay nice and flat if I want it to, or I can take that vertical and I notice my twist direction here. I can take that vertical, open it up, and squash my closed right triangle twist. Again, take this vertical, open it up. I don't have quite enough space to hold on to the vertical itself, but I can hold on to the paper around it and squash my right triangle. So that's how I would resolve an overlap between two open right triangles. Flipping back to the open triangle side, if I look over here to the right, I'm going to see that there's really not enough space to add my next right triangles. Each of these boxes, well, they look five spacings wide, but they're actually another two. There's seven spacings wide. And this only has three. And so I would need much more space than I have to put in the next twist on this edge. So instead, I'm going to look over to the other side where I have two, four, six, seven spacings. Exactly. This is perfect. So I'm then going to rotate my paper going to give it a quarter turn so this part of the paper is in the optimal position for me to work on it. What I want to do next is identify across this mirror symmetry line, how far do I go before I reach something that I can use? Well, I'm going one spacing to hit this valley. And so one spacing on the other side, I'm going to have a valley fold. And I'm just going to focus on this section right now. We'll get to this section in a moment. One spacing outside of the valley fold, we're going to have a mountain because we are working with single depth pleats. Now from here, I need to identify my target triangles. I have existing mountains coming up vertically and you can see nestled 
in the corner. So I've brought the existing mountain one spacing past the horizontal. And in that corner, I can stick a right triangle. So that's the right triangle I'm going to use. I'm going to start by just emphasizing lightly my horizontal plate. Then on the outer side, I'm going to find the diagonal that outlines my target triangle. On the inner side, I'm going to find that diagonal that outlines the target triangle. I'm going to get a pleat overlap over here, but that's okay. We'll, we'll resolve that later. And one at a time, and I would recommend doing the inner one first, further from the edge of the paper, and then the outer twist. It's just more stable if you do the inner one first. I'll get both of my right triangle twists. Next up, I've got this space over here that needs a right triangle twist and doesn't have one. So just like before, I'm going to look down below where is my next valley. I can also look to the right and say, okay, I'm going to need a corner right there that has to be the valley and then a mountain one spacing above that and as we saw exactly as we saw over on this outer triangle I'm gonna get my right triangle nestled in the corner of the vertical and the horizontal with the diagonal going up and to the right so opening my pleat overlap because I need to open this diagonal in order to open the vertical. I'm then going to close the diagonal all the way with the vertical open so that when I put in my new diagonal, it forms a clean pleat overlap and not a jumbled mess. So I'm then going to squash this twist And now we're going to flip over to the opposite side to take care of our pleat overlap and this pointy bit headed off into space. So let's do the easier thing first. I need a closed right triangle here. It needs its corner to come to the corner of the open hole. That means it's going to need a vertical valley right to the corner of the open hole. Then the mountain will be one spacing further out. And I know it has a diagonal and a vertical, therefore it needs a horizontal from this position. And I can go ahead and squash this twist. Now this one, the corner really wants to be squirrely. So I'm just going to be extra careful to make sure my corner pleats are staying in place as I squash down the rest of the twist. Now we're going to do the same thing, but twice over here where I have my corners of the open holes that are going to have the valleys next to them. I'm then going to open up these diagonal pleats. I can see where my mountains, one spacing in from the valleys, are going to be. I'm going to emphasize those and bring up a horizontal mountain between them just like we did for these two twists over here. 
And once I've got that in place, I can flip this horizontal mountain up and squash each twist in turn. This time it really doesn't matter which twist you squash first and which twist you squash second. So there's our two closed right triangle twists. You can see these are mirror symmetric from these two down here. So we'll continue on on the right, the open side. So I'll flip my paper back over. This is where we put those two closed twists just now. And I'm going to rotate 90 degrees clockwise, quarter turn clockwise. So my pleats that are crossing the mirror symmetry line from my open right triangle twists are vertical. So the next thing I'm looking at here is how am I going to mirror across this? I can touch under here and see that this valley is on a diagonal. So if that valley is on a diagonal across the mirror symmetry line, that diagonal is going to go in that direction. So from diagonal here, to diagonal here. We're going to set that in place and note where the mountain associated with that diagonal valley is going to be. And then we can notice, okay, my horizontal is headed straight across the tube. So this, this is what I call a tube pleat because it forms this tube-like structure. And it's going to be a lot easier to um, just take care of both of these twists at the same time instead of folding one and then having a pleat overlap that's super locked up and having to undo that later. So I'll oblige and say, OK, I can trust this line is a mirror symmetry line. That means this is going to be my target right triangle on the other side of it. So these two things line up exactly. They're on opposite sides of a mirror symmetry line. And so I'm going to set up both of these diagonals just gently. I'm not pulling all the way here or I would rip stuff at the top. And once it's gently in place, I'll lift up the center of the tube until I have my vertical, or sorry, my horizontal that's sitting on top of both of these right triangles. Then the valley will be above the mountain for my horizontal. And I'll go ahead and squash my twist. So you can see this tessellation is a very good way to practice both closed and open right triangle twists as you're getting used to them. What I want to do next is continue with my third pleat here. I've got another right triangle twist. It's exactly the same as this one over here. So we can treat it exactly like we did the one on the right, where we have our diagonal going up and to the right, the valley coming to the point, the mountain one spacing further up. This lets us identify our target right triangle. And when we put this right triangle in place, we don't need to worry about a second twist because there's no other vertical pleat over here to worry about. So squashing our twist 
now we have a pleat overlap of two diagonals. And since it's coming from two open right triangles, it's going to go to two closed right triangles. So I can flip my paper over. And here it is exactly the same as this situation, where we're on the other side of a mirror symmetry line. And we've got our valley going from tip to tip of these open right triangle holes. Our mountain is one spacing further. And as I open out this pleat overlap, I'm going to emphasize both the mountains vertically coming to these points of intersection and the mountain between my two target grid intersections. Then I can flip so once I've got it collapsed down, I can flip the vertical over and squash one twist at a time. With these twists in place, I notice one more diagonal plate. And here I'm going to treat it the same way. I'm going to have my valley coming to the tip of the open hole. And I will also need a vertical. And with those pleats in place, I can go ahead and squash my twist. From here, I've got my next mirror symmetry line. And I'm going to just quickly run through um, how I would go about putting in the next set of twists. I'll go ahead and draw some more of these mirror symmetries while I'm here, just to have them all in place. So the first thing I would look at is this pleat over on the left-hand edge. I see that my diagonal coming in is coming from the bottom right. Therefore, across the mirror symmetry line, it needs to go to the top right. That lets me identify my target intersection. And I need to be careful here not to create two diagonals, but instead to create a horizontal pleat coming out to the edge of the paper. Next up, I've got these two closed right triangle twists that I need to put in on either side of this tube pleat. And here I'm going to find the horizontal two spaces up from the mirror symmetry line to set up my right triangle twists on either side. Now, if I wanted to, I could go around and put partial twists in. Um, I would have partial open right triangle twists on each of these three diagonal pleats and also each of these four horizontal pleats. So zooming out to look at the full view, I have several pleats that are um, going off into space and not continuing the infinite pattern, which is the tessellation. But that's OK. This is a practice piece. As you can see, we did not choose to center it appropriately for a display piece. We chose to center it so it would be easiest to start to practice. And what we have as a result is a lovely practice piece centered on this closed right triangle twist. We get several repeats of the motif. Uh, remember, the motif is this box 
containing a closed and an open right triangle. So we've got one, two, three by one, two, three, four full repeats. So 12 full repeats plus three partial repeats down at the bottom. Um, we could do this with more grid and get more repeats. And what I did for this version is start my tessellation in this position of intersection of mirror symmetries. So I started here in the middle and when you want to start a display piece, you're typically going to want to start it at a high symmetry point. In this case, the two positions, actually, sorry, four positions of high symmetry are the corners of the rectangle, the intersections of the mirror lines. Each of those positions is twofold rotationally symmetric. So I could take this position and if we're thinking about the infinite pattern, I could take it this way and rotate it around this way and it's the same thing. I could take this position, rotate it around, it's the same pattern. And uh, so since we've got this rectangle type symmetry, we have four of these twofold positions. And we just got to pick one of them to be the center um, if we're making a display piece. But I talk a lot more about that. Uh, we're already past the hour mark. Um, I talk a lot more about starting a display piece and looking at these symmetries to inform how you choose um, all the various parameters of a display tessellation um, in my um, project planning masterclass. Um, it's kind of a course, kind of a masterclass. It gets updated every year and um, there's a whole lot of um, recordings in there right now um, and you're welcome to go check that out. I'll make sure the link is in the recording um, if it's not there already. And so in summary, what we're going to be looking at when we're looking at right triangle twists is where's my horizontal, vertical, and diagonal? Am I coming to a single grid intersection with diagonals or am I going around a target triangle? That's the distinction between the closed and the open right triangle and we can use each of these twists in a huge array of tessellations. So each of these twists has so many different arrangements that they can be used in. So here we see a eight and four right triangles tiling. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight right triangles around these loops and one, two, three, four right triangles around these and these loops. And so as we're folding, I'm constantly thinking about, okay, how can I close a loop? How can I get to a position where I don't have pleat overlaps? And thinking that way allows me to plan borders on display pieces. It allows me to plan and say, okay, I'm going to have this kind of structure or that kind of structure. I'm going to take these two twists and mirror them versus I'm going to take one twist and mirror it versus I'm going to take four twists and mirror them. And just all of these different options come together to create an infinite array of possibilities with these right triangle twists. So let's review our stack of tessellations and see if you understand them a little bit better now. So I'm going to 
put to the side the ones with hybrid squares for now because we didn't fully cover those. But with these right triangle twists, I've got right triangle twists. You can see they've got a horizontal between these two, a vertical between these two. That must mean the diagonal is going into the square. So little reverse engineering tip here. Always look for where's the horizontal, where's the vertical, where's the diagonal when you're dealing with right triangle twists. If I'm able to see both sides of the tessellation, even better. So here I can see exactly that, yes, the diagonals are going into the square. Yes, these are open right triangles. And I can even see how that spacing is laid out. Okay, I've got a bunch of tubes in here between my clusters of four right triangles around a square. And so when I'm looking at something, trying to reverse engineer, I'm trying to break it down, trying to see what's the smallest piece of this that tells me about the rest. And in this case, the smallest piece of this that tells me about the rest is one of these clusters. If I know one of them, I've got mirror symmetry lines on all sides telling me how to get to the next one. Next, with waffles, I'm looking for what are the loops? I've got a loop of eight right triangles here. And then I've got a loop of right triangle, right triangle, closed square, right triangle, and that is going to be a complete loop of four. And then this open square is coming into the closed triangle, closed square, right triangle, right triangle, other right triangle. So here we have a loop of six. This is a complicated one to analyze. Um, and frankly, especially since the right triangles are so close in to this open square, it's one of the more difficult ones to fold, but I put it out there as a challenge. Um, if you look at my Instagram, this is the waffles tessellation. So you can see even more photos, backlighting, all the rest. Here we've got the same structure, but a little bit simpler, spaced a little bit further apart. Here the right triangles are further from each other along the diagonals and also on the horizontal and vertical. And we can see that these two are the same structure as well. So these are things that I've been teaching to my Tessellations by Tile students um, as the mixed squares and right triangles tiling. Um, I taught that last week and I came into the week thinking, okay, I've got three patterns uh, with these mixed squares and right triangles. I had um, waffles, scattered squares, and linked flowers, which is another one not on the desk here. And coming out of the week of focus on this tiling, we have 11 <laughs> different tessellations. Now, some of those are small changes in spacing, but it's important to be able to recognize that you can make these small changes in spacing in the tiling and still be able to fold your tessellation. So another one, and this I would say is the easiest of the uh, tilings involving right triangles and squares, is the small squares and right triangles tiling. Here we've got a column structure instead of a uh, cluster structure, instead of um, so much of a loop structure, uh, although there are still loops in here. Um, and the columns, due to the fact that all of these pleats are in the same direction, have a choice of whether to stay on the same side or switch to the opposite side. So these are the kinds of things that I've been teaching in Tessellations by Tiles, seeing 
okay, what are the options available? What are the affordances of each tiling? And so we go over 20 different tilings over 24 weeks, starting with the basics, uh, things similar to what I've been doing in the series on the basic twists, and really diving into some of these more unusual tilings that you don't typically see, like these mixed squares and right triangles. Uh, that, frankly, I came up with and I haven't seen anyone else use. Um, the close, the small squares and right triangles and large squares and right triangles, I have seen people use. Um, I haven't seen anyone else fold this one specifically. But there are so many options out there. Um, like, one of the things I'm struggling with this week is that my thumbs are sore because I've been folding so many things, trying to make so many examples visible to my students that um, it's really making me rethink. Um, do I need to look into hand muscle exercises <laughs> just because I'm folding so much and I'm nowhere near exhausting all the possibilities. So I've been full, I've been teaching tessellations for a year now and every time I focus on a topic there's just an explosion of new possibilities that I see. Origami tessellations are nowhere near all discovered. They're nowhere near all folded and there's plenty of space in the world of origami tessellation design for brand new designers. So I want you to think about what you want from your tessellation journey as we come to the close of the series on basic twists. And think about, do you want to focus on reverse engineering other people's patterns? Uh, are, you, are you happy being a once a week folder? Or do you want to dive deeper into the theory, the background, um, trying to come up with your own designs and figure out how to make origami um, a key part of your life, like I have. So I invite you to think on that. And if you want to um, start creating some display pieces of your own, um, both figuring out other people's pieces and then creating lovely tessellations from there, or designing your own patterns, I invite you to check out uh, the Project Planning Masterclass for display pieces. Uh, check out Tessellations by Tiles for designing. Um, now, Tessellations by Tiles is not available all the time. I do have a wait list um, because I do uh, really interact with all of my students closely. And so there's a limited number that I can handle at a time. But the Project Planning Masterclass is available as recordings and you can get it right now. Um, but yeah, all the links will be in the description. If not now, then shortly. And I invite you to join me uh, next week when I explore um, some more definitional things. So a lot of people say uh, tessellation, but it's not a precise use of the word. And so I'm going to be exploring what is and is not a tessellation and what differentiates tessellations from, say, corrugations. So see you next time. And until then, happy folding. <laughs>